So we got to look for and find the ones that might get us there. Again, it's still a very impossible goal. But when you start looking for and finding those new knowledge or resources, right, then then that's really where you want to build your master. I'm Amy Porterfield, ex-corporate girl turned CEO of a multi seven figure business. But it wasn't all that long ago that I lacked the confidence, the budget and the time to focus on growing my small but mighty business. Fast forward past many failed attempts and lessons learned, and you'll see the business I have today. One that changes lives and gives me more freedom than I ever thought possible. One that used to only exist as a daydream. I created the Online Marketing Made Easy podcast to give you simple, actionable, step-by-step strategies to help you do the same. If you're an ambitious entrepreneur or one in the making who's looking to create a business that makes an impact and a life you love, you're in the right place, friend. Let's get started. Hey there, welcome back to Online Marketing Made Easy. I have a special bonus episode for you today, continuing my amazing collaboration with my dear friend Jasmine Starr and some incredible guests. For today's episode, we have the amazing Dr. Benjamin Hardy. Dr. Benjamin Hardy is the ultimate example of how to take control of your future and transform your life through intentionality and self-development. As a psychologist and best-selling author, Dr. Hardy has helped millions through his books, including Be Your Future Self Now, helping people get to where they want to be. Today, you'll hear Dr. Hardy's take on how you can reshape your mindset, make better decisions, and achieve massive goals. I can't wait for you to learn how to take the steps needed to create the future you've always wanted. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Jasmine Star Show, a place where we got to talk about business and mindset. And today we are going to be talking about achieving the impossible. How's that for a suspenseful tagline? I'm bringing you to the precipice of awesomeness. I couldn't be more excited because welcoming back to our show is our ever amazing co-host, Amy Porterfield. Hello, my friend. Okay. So as a quick reminder, Amy has carefully curated some of the most incredible people to be on the show today. And today's guest is nothing short of that. Dr. Benjamin Hardy is incredible. And I will say, go up very far on a limb, that this man has changed my life and business in the last six months. So as I'm reading his writing, as I'm listening to him in my voice, as I am quite honestly taking my earbuds out from the airplane, putting them in my husband's earbuds, and I'm like, just give me five minutes, listen to five minutes. And then he asks me, do you have a piece of paper? And I'm like, I knew it. Of course you need a piece of paper because this guy blows your dang mind. (laughs) Dr. Benjamin Hardy, welcome to the Jasmine Star Show. Yes. I feel like we should clap. We should. Yeah. I was like, no, 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 no. We okay. So. On the Amy Porterfield show, you know, marketing made easy, you clap. Yeah. On the Jasmine Star show, what do we, do? We, we got laser horns. Wah, 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 wah. Oh, <laughs> so, Amy and I are going back and forth. What do you feel most comfortable with? Do we say Ben, Dr. Hardy, Dr. Benjamin? What, what, what do you oh. feel? We're, what do you... we're going Ben right now. Okay. okay. Okay, listen, if I had a doctor in front of my name, I'd be like, is doctor uh, You're like, it's only doctor. It's only doctor. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Ben, thank you so much for being here. Happy um, here. You know, Amy and I, as we were planning, carefully planning the show, we had a theme of the show. And so, Amy, if you would remind yes. Ben, I was like, Dr. Hardy. <laughs> <laughs> if you would remind Ben what the theme is and then talk to us about why you invited him from your perspective. Okay, so the theme of our shows is going against the grain. And doing something that most people wouldn't expect, or in your case, something very unreasonable, impossible goals. Yep. And so we're going to talk about that today. But the reason I chose Ben is that I was at a charity event for Village Impact, and Ben was there, and I had really high heels on on cobblestone. And so I was walking <laughs> down the street, and Ben pulled up and basically said, do you want to ride? And the answer is absolutely yes. So I jumped in the car, and we had already met. It wasn't like I was jumping with the stranger and we got to drive back to the hotel together and I instantly knew there was something special about you. You are a doctor, you are incredibly intelligent, your work is important, but you also have heart. And the Mm. instant he got in the car, he wanted to know all about me. Tell me about you. What do you do? And I just love the person you are and the work that you do. And your work has changed my life. Just like Mm. Jasmine, she's going to tell a funny story Mm -hmm. of how we all got into your work. Mm -hmm. And so I'm so very glad that you're here. Mm -hmm. Yes, Huge fan. 
huge fan. And so just, you know, honored. And by the way, I've never heard of the concept that you came up with, with curating podcast guests. I think it's, in my opinion, the best form of like relationship creation, but also podcast like that. Amazing idea. Thank you. Seriously, Thank amazing you. idea. Thank you, man. Thank yes. you. Now, uh, if you and I were on an elevator together, we're going down four floors and I ask you, what do you do? This is where I want to start the podcast. And so we're, we're absolutely going to get into origin story, but oftentimes podcasts follow a very systematic framework of tell me how you got into what it is you do. And oftentimes I want to actually get the value first. So let's set the framework. Then we're going to go into storytelling. Then we're yep. going to peel back the layers. And then by the end of the show, people walk away with a little bit of swag saying, I'm about to do something impossible. <laughs> yeah. Hey, okay. So four floors, what do we do? I do help uh, individuals and organizations achieve impossible goals. Okay. okay. We weren't <laughs> in front of these fancy <laughs> podcasts, Mike. We're like, okay, so speaking of the impossible, I want to set the stage. Amy and I, uh, with six other women, are in Laguna Beach, California. It's like balmy, 73 degrees. We're looking out on the Pacific Ocean, and we're sitting in this lounge area, and they have these big bay windows and doors open. So the breeze is coming in. A few of us have like bubbly drinks, sometimes tea, and we're talking about doing and achieving things bigger than what we think we can yes. do and how we think, oh, this is absolutely crazy. And so then one woman says, have you read 10X is easier than 2X? And at that point, no. So she gives us this rundown and there was uh, another woman who had read the book and they're going on and on. So finally we have to interject and we're like, great. So happy you guys had that experience. We have no idea <laughs> what you're you talking guys. about. Amazing. <laughs> and they said, well, you need to go and download the book. So that is in the afternoon. The next morning, all eight of us yes. had downloaded and started the book. And I'm listening to you on 2X and I am flying through this content. And I am like, my God. So then the next day, it almost becomes a powwow about the first three chapters. It was. Right? Yes. And so we we're talking about the transformative effect that us taking the belief and saying, okay, what we're a lot of us are aiming to do is to double our business. You know, we're like, okay, we can double it. And here's how we're going to just aim. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, because I'm all about doubling my business. I've talked about sure. that for years. Sure. And I thought that was bold and the way to go. And then I'm listening to this while I'm getting ready in the morning at Laguna Hotel. And I'm like, wait a second. He wants me to 10X. Yes. And he wants me to throw away everything that I'm doing that isn't about this one thing that I want to get to. And I have to tell you, it freaked me out. It yep. really kind of scared me. And I thought, this is going to disrupt everything. So talk to me yes. about that. This is a big disruptor. And why Why do you want it? Do you want it to be a bit disruptor? That's the natural effect. Yes. Yeah. So that's that's part of the effect. So one thing I'll just quickly say, and then I'll kind of explain why you would want that. Okay. Um, I have to give you massive kudos because as someone who has created and shared ideas for a living, it can be, it, it, it's pretty brilliant if you can just like say, okay, that was what I thought for a long time, but I, yeah. I'm, I'm open to this new idea, right? Yes. It's the whole Mark Twain thing. It's not what you know that hurts, or it's not what you don't know that hurts you. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Yeah. So I, I think mm. it takes massive humility to question assumptions, question old frameworks, um, and that's actually part of why you would want to go 10x or why you would want to pursue impossible goals. Okay. I kind of use those two as shorthand for each other. Um, so let me let me honestly just use one kind of framework of time to explain this. Okay. And then honestly, just whatever, yes. <laughs> however you guys want to think yes. about it. So the notion of 2x is rooted in what I'll call a linear approach to time. What I mean by this is, is that it's the belief that the past shapes the present and the present shapes the future. This is how most people do it, where... You know, you can't really go back to the past. And most people, if they're if I want to explain who I am to you, often I'll go back and explain my past, yeah. right? And so usually people use the past to explain the present and they use the present to create the future. Mm -hmm. And so this is kind of how people create 2X goals is they just take where they have and where they're at and they just do more of it, 2X more of it, right? Yeah. And so 10X takes a very opposite approach. And from my perspective as, as a psychologist, it's a more accurate approach of time. Um, one of the problems with the linear approach to time is that the present is actually separate from the past and the future. I can never go back to the past. The future's up ahead. So this is the most real thing right here in the present. My view is, is that the past, present, and future are all existing right now. Um, and that there, and even Albert Einstein said that there's, there's no dividing line between the three. I know that that's kind of a, a big idea, but the main thing is, is that the past, present, and future all exist right now. And that I can actually continuously change my view of the past. That's called reframing, right? And so rather than letting the past dictate who I am in the present, 
I always let the present shape the meaning of my past. The present shape the meaning of your past. Yes, yeah. and that's a more agency-based approach, but that's also how memory works. Okay. And so it's always the present that determines the past rather than the past that determines the present. But similarly, it's not the present that determines the future. It's always the future that determines who you are in the present. I thought that was fascinating. Yeah. The future. So your future self, who you want to be, yes. is going to determine who you are today in the present. Yes, and it already does happen. Like even uh, psychologists, Marty Seligman, he's the father of positive psychology. They've spent a lot of time studying an idea called prospection. Prospection okay. is the idea that as humans, we are very intelligent for one of the reasons that we can actually think about our past and learn from it and even reshape its meaning, reframe. But also I can think about tons of different possible futures. That's called mm -hmm. prospects. And then I get pulled by the future. And so what, what the kind of shift in psychology over the last hundred years has been is rather than a belief that humans are driven by the past, which was that old view, it's that we're actually pulled forward by the future that we're most committed to. And so the, the big important point of a 2x future versus a 10x future is, is that a 2x future is actually based on the past. Mm. And it's not very imaginative. It's not very creative. It's actually mostly just taking the present and just doing more of it. And that's really what the research shows that most people do with their future selves. That's what okay. I do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, you have so much good stuff to say. And I think that I keep on looking at your mic and being like, can we get you closer to the mic? Let's do it. <laughs> Oh my God, people need to hear your voice so buttery, crispy, Hopefully clear it's crispy. In, their, in, in their ear, in their ear. So I want to break down a couple things because totally. when, Let's we, break said, it down as when we, go. we said we're gonna hit the ground running, I was like, oh, well, yeah. I think you run much faster than I do. <laughs> okay, no, so no, no. I want to do a couple things here. So when we were talking about 2Xing our business, yes. let's break this down in like brass Granular. tacks. Do it. There is somebody who's listening right now and you're doing a million dollars. And for you, your big goal is if I can do two million by the end of the year. If there is somebody who has a podcasting goal and uh, they can reach it by doubling the amount of podcasts they have. There's somebody who has an Instagram following and they want to double the amount of content that they're creating to get an end result. And what you're saying is that it is better for us to look at our goal. And instead of saying, I wanna do two million, ask yourself, how do I do 10 million? Yes. And the reason why you're asking us, encouraging us, saying that is the that is the way, is because when we choose to do 10 million or 10x of whatever our goal is, it requires us to shed beliefs about the past, and beliefs about what we can do in the future. Now, one thing we talked about reframing is yeah. that you had said, and many of us, my whole life, my whole life, I was using the past as to proof. explain who you are now? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's been a lot of work about this reframing work. Sure. So I don't think that we can have a real conversation about the belief of 10X until if you, if possible, can you break down what you see the patterns are, specifically our audience's entrepreneurs. When you see an entrepreneur who is saying, the past has brought me or explained why I am here today. What are the common fallacies, the flaws that actually keep that entrepreneur from getting to the 10X? Because we can't talk about it until we actually break down the listener who's like, oh no, this show's not for me. Yeah. Yeah. So I think one thing that's really fascinating is rather than me looking at you and saying, you are who you are because of all your previous experiences, which are super important. You are who you are because of the future that you're most being pulled by. And so like that explains more why we're having this conversation. That now, explains now, more. Following this belief, a person with a stronger idea of their future, do they take more action? Are they more inclined to success? Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. Yes. Mm. Um, when you let the future, and when you become uh, committed to it, conscious about it, thoughtful about it, then it starts to lead to massive disruptions in what you were doing in the past. But to the idea that you were talking about with reframing and why people, one of the things that Dan taught me, which I love, um, he's very, and Dan Sullivan is the one who I wrote three books with, including 10X is Easier Than 2X. He has a beautiful quote that says, before we make our future bigger, let's make our past better. Ooh. I think that's just a beautiful line. Okay, wait, okay, wait, wait. And how do you, that's such a beautiful line, but how exactly, what steps do people take to make that happen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, and, there, and there's so many uh, things I want to share with you. So we'll, we'll start with this whole make the past better idea. Um, but certainly the why of impossible goals or the why of 10X goals and how they simplify things is, is a beautiful thing as well. Because just another, he's very good at pithy things, but he says the only way to make your present better is by making your future bigger. Bigger, that and was so, my favorite quote. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we'll go into that. But to making the past better, it's very important. And this goes to the idea of reframing is just that the past. So one of my favorite quotes comes from a psychologist. His name is Brent Slife. And he, he basically just talks about, and as I said, the past, present, and future are all here right now. So I have a version of my past, 
a narrative of perspective that influences who I am in the present. Mm -hmm. If I have unresolved trauma, as an example, of course that's gonna impact who I am, who I'm being. It's gonna also shape my goals, right? Mm. Um, and it's gonna shape whether I'm uh, nervous and anxious or whether I'm angry, right? And so how we frame our past absolutely shapes who we are in the present. And so my view, and again, I basically said that the past and future are tools. They're incredible tools if used effectively. They're not actual realities. So I can use the past powerfully to improve my present. I can also use the future powerfully to improve my present. Hmm. That's what they're here for. It's like, that's why we're, why humans can be so intelligent. It's also why we can change and grow so fast is because I can take my past and really learn from it so that I actually am a different person from my former self. Can we pause? Yeah, please. Can you give a real example yeah. of how somebody might do this today? Yeah, 100%. So one, like the most basic reframe is gratitude, right? That's the most basic reframe. If, I, if I'm thinking about today, at the end of the day, you know, I do this all the time with my kids. It's just like, how was your day? Eh, not a great day, right? Or it was just, it was just okay. So that's how they've framed their experience of the day, right? That's how they've organized it. That's how they've categorized it. It's like, okay, one way of just reshaping the frame or reshaping the meaning of it the definition of it, the meaning of it, is just thinking about why was it a great day, right? That's just a, a new perspective. What was something you're grateful for? How did you see God in the day, right? You're, these are just different ways of looking at the same thing. And so, that, you know, that's basically what post-traumatic growth is based on, is just taking something that you initially perceived as negative and essentially taking something that, call it a liability. It's something that's costing you. It's something that's maybe ruining your life in the present and actually yes. turning it into an asset. Okay, love this because it's not serving you to look at, mm, it's an okay day or it's a yeah. bad day. Uh, I'm gonna give you an example. You yeah. tell me if I'm on the right track. I grew up with a really strict father and I had sure. a really hard childhood with him sure. and didn't feel worthy enough. However, I've done a lot of therapy and I have reframed it. My hard work ethic, the fact that I work till I get it done, that was from my dad. I learned sure. hard work from that man. So I have reframed how he raised me and what that looked like because it has served me today and it will serve me in the mm. future. Is that a good example? I think that's a much more useful past than the other. Yes. Right? Again, it's a tool and it's gonna impact who you are. And one of them is gonna maybe lead to hopelessness or depression or anger and one of them is going to lead to empowerment right okay. and so yeah you want to get better and better at at squeezing the juice out of it uh, that's a that's a beautiful example i'll give an example of a, like a company i consult is that okay. all right yeah. so this is this is an amazing company they're doing 200 million in revenue we're going to get them to a billion in three years again one thing that's just funny about past and future is tools their goal was to accomplish their get to a billion in 10 but that that as a future is so far away that it doesn't force um, urgency and the whole disruption ideas. Yes. It doesn't that, it doesn't force enough on the present. You take the same goal and you make it three years, that starts to force a lot of things on the present. Because these, again, are just tools for moving forward better mm. in the present. And so one of the things, we just did a like a training. I went to Atlanta where they're based, trained their leadership team, and this was at the end of Q1, 2024. So what, 20 days ago, 25 days ago? And we have some impossible goals that we're going for, even the bigger goal of the billion, but then shaping that back, we've really clarified. One of the things that's really cool is you, when you have an impossible goal, massive future, what I say is, is that, that that massive goal sets a really high floor. And the floor means you can't say yes to a lot of things because the goal is so high that most things won't get you there. Um, most strategy, you don't know how to do it, that's why it's impossible, but most of the things you're doing right now won't get you there, and so the floor is high on what you say yes and no to. And so, We've set a really high floor for this company. Their leader's very adamant, like we don't go below the floor anymore. Like we don't say yes to those types of clients, opportunities, mm. even certain team members gotta we go. We say no. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, difference between successful and really successful people is that really successful say no to almost everything. They have a really high floor and filter, same thing. But anyways, to the idea of properly categorizing the past, framing the past, because of our impossible goal and what we're trying to accomplish in 2024, um, Q1 has been about figuring out what's above that floor. The strategy is above that, you know? In 10X is easier than 2X, that language would be figuring out the 20%, right? Versus the 80%. The 80% would be below that floor that we've got to get rid of. But we want to find and figure out and then better execute on the few things that'll get us to the billion. Can you uh, break down that 80-20 for the listener real quick? Yeah. Because I don't want to pass over that. That's like a huge, yeah. that is a and huge we'll, benchmark yeah, yeah, in yeah. the book. Yeah, and we'll go deep into it. But yeah, 80-20 principle, Pareto principle, very famous business idea that, you know, and, and I, I use this idea loosely, but just that 80% or more of your success or your results is going to come from like very few of things of what you do. They call it the essential few, which is what we'll call the 20%. You know, you, you can think about this in terms of people, like 20% of your 
you know, 20% of the people in your life are creating 80% of your success, right? Or 80% of your happiness, uh, you know? And, and so it's just, it's finding and filtering for those few things that are, that have the highest leverage and impact. And honestly, stripping out everything else. How does one find that? By having an impossible goal, genuinely. You want a goal that's so high that because it's so high, um, almost everything you're doing right now won't work. So if you, you know, and I will, I love this because it gives a little more context and then I'll kind of share how we used these ideas to help them properly frame their Q1 because they were, they, they organized it in such a way that it, it was going to lead Q2 and the rest of the year for disaster. Um, but the, the main idea here is, is that if you're going for a small goal, even a 2x goal, because the present and the future look so similar, you know, honestly, 2x may feel big, but it's it's not that distinct. Right. It's not that different from who I am now. And honestly, it's taking the present and just creating more of it, just a little bit bigger. And so one of the framework, the core framework of 10x is easier than 2x is, is that if you go for 2x, you can keep 80% of what you're now doing. Yes. You know, if you think about growing this podcast by 2x, or if I think about doubling my book sales or doubling revenue, I don't have to change that much. I do yeah. have to figure out a new 20%. That's just a, an analogy, but I have to figure out a few new things, but Honestly, it's a lot of what's already working. Yeah, it's like, yeah. it's just maybe double down on what's already working, yes. you know? And so you really don't have to change that much to go 2X. It's not very creative. It's certainly not disruptive, um, to your point. And so it's it's very much a linear approach. Take the past, present, and use that to create a very similar future, maybe just a little bit bigger of a future. And so when you really think about a 2X goal, a big problem with that is is that it's not, it, it's not distinct enough to actually help you uh, parse Right. the 20 from the 80. And so you can't fully know what are the best things because it's just not a, a good enough filter. And so making the goal so big that you honestly don't fully know how to do it and then asking really hard questions from that future, like what would have to be true to begin pursuing this impossible goal? There's actually, interestingly, a lot of research on impossible goals. And um, I, I'm going to actually just, this is where I think I should just share the analogy of my son, Caleb, because yes. I think this is the easiest way to do it. So I love the quote. It's from Anais Nin. She says, we don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are, right? Mm -hmm. Have you heard that? We don't see the world yes. as it is. One of my psychology professors said, if a, if a man says a woman is beautiful, he's actually describing himself. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Because he's describing wow. his perspective, okay. right? Yeah. He's describing his preference, right? If I say that car is amazing, am I describing the car? I'm mostly describing my perspective. And so we don't see the world as it is, we see the world as we are. And, and they call that a frame or a frame, a mental model. We see the world through a perspective, a frame. And so one way of, maybe, of really looking at this is my son Caleb is a high school tennis player. He, um, we live in Orlando, mecca of tennis, tons of tennis. He loves tennis. He wants to play college tennis. And this is kind of one of the first stories I told to explain impossible goals in 10X is easier than 2X, but his coach really challenged Caleb. His coach said, Caleb, what is your goal? And Caleb said, my goal is to play college. And his coach pushed back and said, why isn't your goal to go pro? And from my view, the pro goal absolutely is an impossible goal. Um, and impossible goals are like the definition of it. They actually, in psychology, they use the word stretch goal. Yes. But stretch goal is a pretty weak term. Mm -hmm. And the actual definition is a goal that is unattainable from your with your current perspectives, capabilities, Ooh, resources, like yeah. you don't know how to do it and it actually is an unattainable goal. And so that's how I would view Caleb going for pro. It, it seems like an impossible goal. But after that conversation, um, you know, the, the big idea here is, is that there actually probably are in Orlando, conceivably probably a thousand effective pathways to get him to college, even in Orlando. The high schools are pretty strong. He could play for almost any of the high schools and he'd get good coaching. He could go to a ton of the different academies, get good coaching. Obviously, some are much better than others and we would still want to like filter for the better ones. But if he was going for college, there's a lot of possibility, a lot of possible pathways yes. of getting there. Whereas if he genuinely went for the pro goal, just speaking of Orlando, the like the realistic pathways would fall to maybe zero, maybe one or wow. two. Like maybe there's one or two realistic coaches that could get him there. And so if you use that future, call it a 10X future, as the frame, right? The perspective that you now make decisions by. Again, to the idea of floor, the floor is so high in terms of the standard of what you can say yes and no to that if we actually went for pro, almost all of the options for college would be no-goes. Like almost all the options would not help him achieve the goal. And so if we let that future dictate what we say yes and no to in the present, yes. it would allow us yes. to find and filter for the best options that have the highest likelihood 
of getting us where we want to go. Okay. So I have a question about that then. If we're making these impossible goals, like going pro for your son, what are some tips that you have to, what questions do you ask? What do you look for? Because Mm -hmm. as you said, we don't even know how to get there. And I think that's that's the the daunting part. That's the part I don't like, Ben. (laughs) I want you to take that part out. So how do I, what do I, I don't know what to do when it's an impossible goal. What are the tips you have to figure that out? Yeah, absolutely. So I want to get there and I also want to make sure we talk about making the past better. Okay. But but okay. I want to get there. One thing I'll say though, one of the things that they say in the research, which I agree with, and this fits with your idea of disruption. So in the book, Good to Great, Jim mm-hmm. Collins, mm-hmm. famous book, he talks about the idea of BHAG. Yes. Right? Um, BHAG is a goal that, let's Hold say- Hold on, let's define BHAG. Yeah, I will. Okay. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the yeah, acronym. Yeah, okay, you go ahead. Big, hairy, audacious goal. Yeah. BHAG. Yeah. Great. BHAG, big, hairy, audacious goal. Basically, it's an impossible goal. Yes. Yes. Let's get to the moon in 10 years. BHAG. Right? No clue how to do it, but it's it's measurable, it's powerful, it's impossible, and we don't know how to do it, so let's figure it out. Like, that's a BHAG. 10 years to 30 years is what they say. My And, and, and Jim Collins is very specific. He says the only purpose for setting a goal this big is because it disrupts your company in the present. That's the point. That's the point. Okay. Is that the goal is so big, so inconceivable, that it forces you, it forces a lot more honesty on the business right now and says, Fetch. Not almost nothing we're doing right now is going to get us to that yeah. BHAG. So let's, you know, so to the idea of Caleb <laughs> going pro, what are the few things that might get us there? Let's start exploring those. Okay. So and so it leads there. to it leads to exploration and learning of things. Like as an example, if a company wanted to genuinely 10x in a year, yes. you know, um, and I do have some fun stories about that. Even 10xing in 60 days. Um, you know, there's some. I'll, I'll tell. I'll, I've got some. <laughs> we, I, I, I want to know. But, I know. I was like, I no, want that. But but the but the fun thing here is is that its purpose is actually what it's it, what it says in the literature, which I love is it creates a crisis in the present. Yeah. Because you don't know how to do it, and then you start to really analyze everything going on in the current business from the goal rather than toward it. This is key. You always want to come. The future is what determines the present, not the present shaping the future. So you want the arrow to come backwards back. from the future. Yes. So you always want to operate from the future. Okay. And so because it's so big, so it's so impossible, um, like Caleb going pro, it's like, okay, let's just look at everything on the table, right? Let's be honest. Most of this stuff absolutely wouldn't get us there. Mm-hmm. And so that's what it does. It, But then it leads you to a lot of unique learning. You know, the, the learning and exploration of, well, let's start looking for information and ideas that are closer in that ballpark that I would never have been looking for or filtering for. You would never have been looking for that stuff without the goal. And so it leads you on an exploration and on a learning process. And that's one of the main reasons you said an impossible is it leads you to learning unique, interesting things that other people aren't learning because they're not going for the goal. Think about Elon Musk going for Mars. Like how many things does he have to learn and solve to even attempt that goal that he wouldn't be learning if he was going for some other goal? Like, yes. And so it leads to unique learning and, and the building of knowledge, resources, et cetera. Um, on that note of resources, and then yeah. I want to go back to sure. reframing the past yeah, because I don't think that we can actually move towards the future if we don't reframe the past. Sure. Would you agree? It helps massively. Okay. It helps massively. I agree. Yeah. Okay. So um, as we're defining that 10X sure. goal and we don't know how to do it, what if you get to a point to where you realize that there's a couple things that you could start cutting away and then start doing to achieve the 10x goal. But you realize that you can't cut away some of the stuff that's funding where you yes. are right now. Like, you know, and Elon Musk talks about like the very first thing you want to do is you always want to question your assumptions, question your requirements. Because he says most people are optimizing a thing that shouldn't exist. What I mean by that is we're spending a lot of time growing something that shouldn't exist because it actually, and I'll call that the 80%, it actually isn't helping us get to our real goal. And so when you make a goal that impossible, whether it's so big or whether it's so close, it actually allows you to let go of things that shouldn't exist, that, that you're spending a lot of time growing. I'll just give myself as an example. I actually was growing a YouTube channel. And I'm not against YouTube. I actually think YouTube's a phenomenal tool. But for me, when I got really clear about my 10x, my future self, I was pouring a lot of energy into YouTube. And I realized this is something that actually shouldn't exist. It should exist for a lot of businesses and for a lot of people. But for me and my goals my path is going to be very different. And so it allows you to strip away the how things did, you thought were required to achieve your goal. Got it. But how did you figure that out? How yeah. did you say, oh, YouTube isn't for me? What yeah. were the questions you asked yeah, or yeah, yeah. you looked into? Okay. I'm going to pause this and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm actually going to just talk about the past for a okay. second. <laughs> just because I have to, but this is perfect. Okay. No, no, no. Benchmark this, benchmark this just because I want to get to this. So we're going to talk about, okay, resources, risks, and how did you figure it out? Okay. Right? Let resources, me, risks, and, and how did you I, figure it yeah, out? Yeah, because that was okay. your question. I yeah. just want to quickly say, 
with these ideas in mind, the, the impossible goal sets this really high floor, really high floor. Mm -hmm. And the floor is the dictator of what you say yes and no to. And for an impossible goal, the floor is so high because almost nothing will work, right? Yes. Most coaches for Caleb won't get him to pro. So the floor is really high. Most of those are no. So we got to look for and find the ones that might get us there. Again, it's still a very impossible goal. Um, but when you start looking for and finding those new knowledge or resources, right, then, then that's really where you want to build your mastery. By the way, one of the ways I look at it is, is that your system is your floor. They're the same thing. It's what you can do consistently. And so, like, it's what you're really good at. And so when you raise the floor really high, you're not good at it. You know, and I'll, I'll give, but let me just give this example because I think just helping organize the past and then we'll go truly. So this company that I'm working with, they had an impossible goal, which we're going for in 2024. And we then had a team meeting. I trained their leadership and we would, um, you know, I it, it started with, and they've read the gap in the game. So they're like, all right, let's start with wins. Yes. You know, let's start with our progress. But because we're not actually trending towards the goal for the year, yes, their top leader basically said, all right, here's where we're at. We're nowhere near our goal, like in terms of like trending. Mm -hmm. Like we're not trending towards the goal at all. So Q1 was a disaster. Q2 better be a lot better. Okay. That's how we started that's, the meeting. That's that very daunting. Okay. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> all right, that is a very bad past we just created. Yes. <laughs> like this is not going to help us create a foundation um, that's going to help us go for impossible goals in Q2. And so I said, let's, we actually took, and often in meetings, people like to start with wins and stuff, but truly they spend like two minutes and they're like, all right, let's get to the future. And it's like, all right, that's cool. We like the future. But I'm like, we're spending an hour on this because I really want to know what the heck happened in Q1. I want to know about it. I want to understand it. And I want you to better understand it. I want you to better see it. Because if I can better understand your Q1, we can 10x what happened in Q1 in Q2 effectively. But I first want to know what truly happened. And right now is all I hear is we're nowhere near the goal. It was a bad quarter. So I gave them some time to think about it. What was the most important things we learned? What were the most important forms of progress? One of the things that happened with this company is, is that they are so much clearer on the floor for their company, what that means and how to actually start achieving it. Um, they would be equivalent to Caleb finding that coach. And now he's learning how to work with that coach. We are now learning what's required above where they're trying to go. And if they master that, they're going to be a billion dollar company in three years. So one of the things that they do, this is a franchise company. It's a flooring franchise company. Okay. So within this company, there are 300 franchisees wow. all throughout the United States. Okay. Right. And so these franchisees, they sell flooring, could be carpet, could be other things. And um, the average franchisee has a business doing about $700,000 a year. 700,000. So I'll call that their floor since that's their average. That's really good. They're really good at creating that, you know? And so 14 of their franchisees are above 2 million. Okay. One of them's 10 million. So we said in order to actually achieve the billion dollars in three years, their new floor has to be 2 million. Rather than the average being, you know, 700,000, it's gotta be 2 million. And so then we have to ask, well, what's the difference between these two groups? The ones that are 2 million and above always ha have at least one phenomenal salesperson in their business that we call them, we call them a beast, right? But like this is a salesperson who can get at least a million dollars of sales by themselves. The difference between the 700 person and the 2 million is that the $700 person, you know, this is like a who not how question. They do not want to hire that beast because they're a lot more expensive. And if they hire that really good salesperson, then their role shifts, the franchisee, and they've got to put more into marketing and feed the beast. This is what I call it. This is my language. And so they hire bad salespeople, mm -hmm. and, and, they, and then that turns them into micromanagers. Whereas if you hire a really phenomenal person, then you shift from manager to leader because they don't want to be managed. You just give them an impossible goal, and as a leader, you've helped them achieve the impossible, but you got to feed the beast. And I'm only explaining to you the difference because in Q1 of this, this, of this year, because they're now clarifying this, they're actually learning what's required to master above the floor. They never were doing that before because they only had 14 out of 300. They actually weren't good at creating or franchisees or entrepreneurs at that level. They were really good at creating managers. And so we learned, no, you got to set the floor and we got to get good at getting all of these people up there or getting rid of them and finding new franchisees that will get there. And so again, reverse engineering this and learning the big difference is, is that the people to get to, to get to 2 million, you've got to 
invest in this epic who, and I honestly believe that this is true of every business. If you want to go 10x, and even there's a great book on it called The 80-20 Individual, but like you really need to bring in elite people, like elite people. Okay. And and B players will not hire A players. But so here's here's just the big idea is, is that in Q1, we looked at it and because they're really focusing on this, they helped 15 of their franchisees add one of these beasts. Okay. And so we know that if they do that, and if they help that franchisee focus and grow, all 15 of those are going to be $2 million plus companies this year. They're not there yet. So we're not trending yet. And you need the on-ramp to get the salesperson yeah, fed yeah, yeah. and all of that stuff before they're actually closing. But just the See. really simple idea here is, I then asked them these questions. These are really good for helping them frame the past. So I said, okay, so you just added 15. And we know that this is the crucial lever. This is the 20% that's going to get you above that floor. And so... I said before Q1, so at the beginning of the year, how many of these beasts or these amazing salespeople did you have throughout all these franchisees? They said 21. This is a business that's been around for 50 years. So I said, let me get this straight. In all those 50 years, you added, you had 21 of these amazing salespeople in the whole business. And now in Q1 alone, you just added 15. Wow. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that to me sounds like you made the right progress. And you, yes. but also last one is this, I said this, and this is a really important framing question. I said, if we were to go all the way back to 2023, and if your 2023 self at January were to hear about what you just accomplished in Q1, mm. what would they think? And they said, we would have never thought it was possible because we would have never seen how to do that. Like we would have never even known how to look. We would have, that again, because they were so muddled in their own 80% and so muddled in, you know, but because the goal was so high and it forced clarity around that floor, and then it forced us to say, we're only doing things above that. And that helped us find, okay, the difference is, is we need to get a lot of these salespeople. Now we're building the system around that new floor, which is getting a lot of these people. So the amount of progress that they actually made was more progress in that quarter than I'd say they've made in terms of learning growth potential and what's going to set them up. Probably more growth in that quarter than they've had in the last five or 10 years. Mm. But again, remember what the leader said at the beginning. We're not trending. It was a horrible quarter. And so that's how you properly frame your past is you mm. actually look for what is the most effective things we actually learned. Another beautiful question is, how am I different from who I was? You know, they could say, how are we different from who we were at the beginning of the year? I could also ask, just in a simple way, how am I different from who I was last week? Mm. What do I now know? How am I different from my past self? The reason this is beautiful is because it helps me realize I'm not my past self. I'm not attached to that same identity. Mm. I'm not that person. And I'm, and by, and again, remember it's the present that shapes the future. It's the present that creates the future or sorry, it's the present that creates the past. Um, and so by actually thinking about that, it's just like gratitude. I'm looking for what I'm happy for. If I'm looking for, how am I different? How am I better? I'm now creating a past that shows me how much I've grown in the past week. And now I can see, wow, I'm massively different from my past self. This is really useful foundation for creating a future self that's massively different than your present self. So this is just, I think, one useful way. I know that, that was a long, and okay, I really, hold on. I'm I just, really, I hope I that, that take, I, hope, I hope that wasn't too much. I just, I actually, it wasn't enough. So <laughs> I just feel like so much gratitude. I feel so much gratitude. I feel like I could be nice to myself, man. When I think about what happened, like the, the let's past year, let's talk about this. Let's yeah. talk about this. About what, when I think about, because I feel like it's not happening fast enough. Whatever it is, sure, it's not happening fast enough. Yeah, and I think to myself that I led leading up until thirty seconds ago, looking back and saying, "Wasn't good enough." Wasn't good enough, guys. When, dang, like there is a former version of me who would look at what I did yes. in my in my year and be like, "I can't believe you just did that." But for me, I'm I'm that leader who says it's yeah. not enough. Let's go to the future, and I just have not given myself the grace to say, "Who have I become?" What have I learned and what am I letting go of? And I just feel so free. I feel so good. It's like, Ben, you took us to church <laughs> and we talked about reframing. Church. We talked about reframing. Then we were going to talk about resources. Yeah. Um, but Amy, I didn't want to, I didn't want to cut off. If I there was also want to go somewhere and we'll get there. Yeah. I want to talk about some of the myths that come up around success when you're going through this process. Because I'm assuming a lot of myths, a lot of challenges, a lot of limiting beliefs will stop you from any of this happening. Just like Jasmine had said, like, oh my gosh, I need to give myself grace. So I do want to explore that as well. But where should mm -hmm. we go? Well, 
I uh, I really like this idea that we had, we were focused on reframing and then we were going to focus on resources. And then we had talked about building. And so in my mind, I wanted a third R. So I would just say like restructuring, <laughs> but we could come up with like a different R if we think that that's... Well, risk is a big one. Oh, that was risk. It was yeah, risk. Okay, people, okay, people always... Okay, so their, what we just did... Can I did, just add one thing to you please. real quick? I don't think, because you said a version of your past self, some, you know, the beautiful part is you can just keep going back. But like... Some version of your past selves would look at what you've done in the last year or even in Q1 of 2024, Amen. as we're speaking. Amen. And, and some version of your past self would look at it and it would not even, it would blow it would their blow, minds yeah, because the blow. things you're doing were way outside the reference of what they were even thinking what was is possible. possible. And so what I'm arguing though is this, that version of your past self isn't very far back. Mm -hmm. I, used, I used them at the beginning of 2023 as the example. I could have used them halfway through 2023 as the example, just less than a year ago. And if even even if that version of them looked ahead, they still wouldn't believe what had just happened. That's me. It can happen That's fast. Me. It happens yeah, fast. it does yes. happen fast. And I will even argue, you can get so good at this, at, 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 at call it squeezing the juice out of the past, that even a week ago, my past off a week ago could look at this week, you know, say it's a Friday, and I'm just reviewing the week. If I go back to the beginning of the month, the beginning of April, right, and I'm just thinking about the big myself at the beginning of April, looking at my week, there are things that did happen and things that are happening that even myself a month ago wasn't, wasn't even uh, able to comprehend. Mm. And so you get really good at this. And I just mm. think it's, you know, but that's a pass now that they can use to say, all right, we got 15 beasts. What's the impossible goal? Because we know that's the 20%. We ultimately did set the impossible goal for Q2 to get 50. Wow. And, wow. and, even if we just did 15, 15, 15 and got 60, we'd be on track for hitting the billion in three years, but now they're going for 50. Mm. And they're, again, using that as the filter for determining what they say yes and no to as a team. So anyways. Oh, okay. I feel like I just, I feel like, can we have a moment Ooh. of silence? I want 15 minutes and I'm gonna write. Because it's like you talk about squeezing the time for what it's worth, me yesterday. Me yesterday couldn't Your imagine. Your past self yesterday. My past self yesterday. 100%. Couldn't imagine all the goodness that has transpired and how I've like, I feel fundamentally energetically changed. Sure. So thank you. Um, now let's go into, I, I'm still tapping here, the resources. Because somebody yep. is listening and saying the 10X, like I'm a million dollars, I wanna do 10 million by next year, but yep. what would be required of me to let go to hit the 10 million is the thing that's currently funding me right yes. now. Yep, yep, yep. So this is a really awesome question, it's common. Um, so let's look at it. One of the things that I think is really interesting is, is that the future is a tool. This is important to realize the future is a tool. As an example, Caleb thinking about the future to, of going pro to generate pathways, right? But the future is also actually oddly the source of the resources. It's, it's weird. It's like, I look at the okay, future. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, I, wow. need, I think I need to admit it. The, <laughs> future, again, yeah. the future is a source of resources. It is. How so? Gosh, well, because think, think about it. So in, you've heard of the concept of like um, supply and demand, yes. right? So, you know, you, you, you have certain supply and that generates demand, right? If there's low supply in, a, in stuff, you know, it might have high demand. So psychologically, it's, it's actually the opposite. Um, psychologically, it's, it's demand that creates resources. So like you've probably heard it said, when the why is strong enough, you will find the how. Yes. Or, Ooh, you'll, yes, or yes. also you'll find yes. the who. And so that why and the depth of it and even the specificity of it is what creates the how. It's also what creates the resources. And so, um, you know, if there's a reason, as an example, if there's a reason that I've got to make $10 million in the next 30 days, that's a future that's now demanding me of me to find that Ooh. $10 million that I otherwise wouldn't have needed to even look for, figure out, or solve had I not had that future. And Ooh. so the future determines what resources are needed. You know, Elon Musk, I, I apologize to use him twice, but he needs to figure out billions of dollars of funding and even rocket technology and innovation to achieve his goal. All of that's coming from his goal. All of the creation. Can I give you an example? Please. I'll give you an example. So there is a, and this is someone who actually almost 10 x in 60 days. And so this is a really fun example. So this is a guy in South Carolina who has a property management company. Okay. So he has another business as well, but this is a property management company. So if you own two or three houses, and you don't want to deal with the rent, like the, the renters, you let them manage your company. You let them manage the houses, right. right? They handle the whole thing. So when I met him, so I did like a challenge at the end of 2023. So it was for the last 60 days of 2023, November and December. Okay. And so it started on November 1st and it ended January 1st. Okay. 
So we had 60 days. He came in. And at that time, his property management company had two employees, phenomenal employees. Um, again, this is a smaller business. It was doing probably low six figures. Um, but they had 60 properties under management. And it would take them two years to get there. You know, and so they probably had 20 or 30 clients. You know, some of them had one house. Some of them yeah. had three or four. And so he meets, he got, he's and joins the challenge. He learns some of these ideas I'm sharing that the future is what determines the present. And basically I say, set an impossible goal for the next 60 days. And then let that be the determining factor of what you say yes and no to and go find those better pathways, right? And so he was listening to this, thinking about it. And ultimately he set the goal of having 500 properties under management by the end of the year. So going from 60 to 500, almost a 10X. That feels impossible. It is yeah. impossible, yeah. yeah. But again, the idea of impossible um, is that it's impossible, again, from the context of your current self. Yes. And so based on your current knowledge, resources, based on your current you know, knowledge team, et cetera, uh, and you don't know how to do it. And so he went to his team of two and he said, here's the goal. We're going to have 500 in the next 60 days. I don't know how we're going to do it, but let's start strategizing again from the goal. Let's start figuring it out. What from do we do? From the future. Yeah. Pulling from the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You always strategize from the future because if you're strategizing from your current situation, that's, again, what we call 2X. Yeah. You're just trying. They couldn't actually achieve the 500 by approaching it the same way they did to get to 60 because you just do, we just don't have time to get, you know, get it by ones and twos. Okay. And so ultimately they started looking at their Rolodex, looking at things. And even again, to the idea that the impossible goals lead to exploration of new solutions or ideas or knowledge that you wouldn't have been looking for had you didn't have the goal. So ultimately, of course, they started looking for people with hundreds of houses. Um, just, uh, you know, the strategy, the idea that came from that, and then beginning to look for where do these kind of people are? How do we get in touch with these kind of people? Ultimately, and he also added two team members. When you have an impossible goal, it's going to be a fundamentally different level of commitment than you've ever committed to. Because the goal is so big, you're going to have to commit. And big part of commitment is investment. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to be committed more than you've ever been committed to. This is what scares people. This is the idea of risk as well as yes. resources. Where do we get the resources to make this investment, right? Um, so anyways, he did add two team members because he was so committed to the goal. He's like, I know we can't do it with just you two. Yeah. So he added two A-plus players. And basically... This is a really big difference between leadership and management is, is that managers manage the process, whereas leaders give a very, I'll call it impossible goal. Um, and so, you know, leaders help people achieve things that they didn't think were possible. And they show them how they support them in doing it. Like that's pretty much the definition of a transformational leader. And so he gave them the impossible goal and he said, you guys figure this out, solve it. I'm here to support. I'm going to be trying to solve it too. And so he didn't give them the how because the how they didn't know. Right. But he gave them the goal and it was inspirational. And, and ultimately, they ended the year with 320. Right. So they didn't finish the year with the 500, okay. but they did find way new, amazing ways of finding people that they weren't deploying before. And they did find one person with like 160. They found someone with like 75, whatever it was. They, they found like three or four big clients that took them to 320. And so in those two months, they over 5 x their business. That's huge. Okay, I have a question about yeah. this. Would you say it's fair to say that, because one of my questions was, I'm a little bit of a Debbie Downer with this question, but what Downer. happens when you hard. don't hit that goal? Yeah. So they had 500. Mm -hmm. What What do you say? What do you feel? What What goes on there? But I think I'm learning that they hit 300 and something. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess here. They Go hit ahead. 320. They are different people. They sure. are a different business and they are way ahead of where they would have been if they tried to two exit. So maybe the goal is not necessarily to absolutely hit the 500, but it's who you become along the way. Am, am I on the right track? I think you're on the track. So remember this, and this is something that always hits people. Um, the past and the future are tools. Past and the future are tools. They're tools. And so if they five X their business in 60 days, and because they didn't hit the target that, that they were using as, as the filter for their yes. present. Remember, the future is just a tool for operating in the present. So they use the future as a tool. It's not a reality. So who there is no reality of them with 500. Okay. There is no reality of right. them with 500. That's a tool. That's a lot better tool than if they were going to go for 100, which would have been more their trajectory, right? The 500 is a tool. They hit 320. Now it's their choice in the present how they frame that. Remember, mm. The mm, present determines is. the past. 
and the past is a tool. And so if I feel like a loser and I frame it that way that the, the last 60 days were awful because we didn't hit our our tool of an right. idea of a future that never existed, it was just an idea that I'm using to shape my decisions in the present. And so, yeah, this is one of the one of the things that people often say is, if, okay, if I'm going to go for impossible goals, you know, what happens if I don't hit it, you know? Exactly. It's like, what does that have to do with anything? The past and the future don't exist. They're tools. Like hey. literally they so, are tools. Hey, so if you and I were having a conversation yes. and we probably will because it's life and business in the future and you love, girl, you love big goals, like yes. huge goals, yes. as do I. But if in the future, for some reason, you don't happen to hit a goal, even though everybody knows Amy Porterfield tailors her goals. <laughs> if for some reason there is a goal that you do not hit and you're trying to be optimistic and you're saying, but it's who I became in the process. Number one, I would be like, that's great. Continue watching the Hallmark Channel. I love that. That's like your higher self. I would also say in December, you did more in December than you had done in the previous 11 months in December because you had landed those people. So it's like, okay, sorry you didn't hit it, but you just did more in one exactly. month than you had done all year. So I was just like, yes, we can be thankful for who we are, but we could also be like, look at those commas and zeros that like probably would not have existed had That's we not pushed ourselves. See, like you and yeah. I are very tactile. Like, yeah. We like being warm and fuzzy, but we also be like, mama likes money too. I, yeah, so, like I need yes. to land it. And I think that's what landed it. You just hit 320. You would have never done that if Absol you did not go for it. If you hadn't gone for it. No, you yes. wouldn't have. They'd, they'd be probably like 65. Yes. And they wouldn't yeah. have had the two new team members yeah. and yeah. all of the new knowledge and Learnings. capability yes. to grow. So this is where, so yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> you know, but this is similar to even how the big company that I was talking about, the franchise company, was would have framed their past was, you know, they were not trending. And so they didn't actually analyze and didn't see that they had actually you know, <sighs> added those 15 beasts. And so they didn't realize uh, how much growth and development. Now with this one, they had added one client with 170. That's that one client alone was over. It was it was almost three x their business just yeah. in one. And yes. so think about yes. the capability yes. of being able to do that. And so, but think about it again, similar to what I was saying with the prior one. If we went back, so say it's right at the end, right on January first, and they're at three twenty, and they get to choose how they frame it. Yes. Right? Right. Okay. How are we gonna think about this? We didn't hit the five hundred. So all right, well let's go back to your past selves back in October before you even thought about this and before Amen. you set this goal. Yes. If we had Amen. talked to your October self, Shh. they would say, they no, would be like, no way. And said, hey, no just, you yes. know, so we're, 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 we're at their January 1st self and we're, we're sending a letter back to their past self, which is in October and saying, hey, just so you know, we're gonna have 320 <laughs> in this business. Yeah. This person with 60 would have been like, <laughs> yes. they wouldn't have believed it, right? Yes. But now we're calling it a failure because we didn't hit 500. <sighs> Stop preaching. Yeah, yes. My soul can't take it. <laughs> my soul can't take it. That is powerful. Uh, so yes. when we go through all of this and people are listening as a, as a parting thing, because the books that Amy and I have listened to and read have led us to a point where it, it's kind of like coming into another pinnacle, like another peak of your career. And so you have a book coming out. And here's the thing. People like... Amy and I, a Amy and I have, I've told Amy, I don't want, I don't like when people come on the podcast for like what we call, what I call, nobody else calls, what I call like the book podcast train because everybody has like the same conversations. But you and I had a conversation and you're dropping a book in October and it's a, a culmination of a lot of work that you've done. Yes. And t talk to us about the book. Talk to us about achieving impossible goals and then what, like a parting takeaway for somebody who's listening and being like, I'm scared and I'm not quite sure that I believe that this impossible goal is possible. But if we can tap there for a second in closing. Sure. Yeah. So Rapid Transformation uh, is the title of the book. The subtitle is actually The Science of Achieving Impossible Goals. See, this is where I, the <laughs> science of it. Don't yes. give me the Give me the science. Hey, I can't even yeah, wait. Yeah, I know. But um, yeah, and I, I honestly am, I'm here on a, Wednesday in Nashville, I flew here. You Big, flew here. He flew here. We, we're we're months us. from that. And honestly, like I find out about, you know, this opportunity. I'm hopping on a plane. I'm flying home right after. I'm having a blast. Like, and so I'm happy to to be here and hang out with you. But yeah, so it's it's largely what we've been talking about. You know, the this past, present, future model. Um, or I'll call it the holistic time model. That model, I had a lot of that understanding when I wrote call it gap in the gain in 10x, but I didn't actually lay out that model of, you know, call it the the past, present, and future all exist here and now. I've learned that. I didn't create that. You know, there's but just to the idea that the future determines the present and the present determines the past, right? Um, I don't think honestly I'm sharing with you, I don't think that that idea has been encapsulated in any of psychology. 
purely mm. and simply. Um, and, and psychology as a discipline is very scattered, very fragmented. And there's even a lot of interesting ideas nowadays that a lot of psychology actually makes people worse. Of course, you can use it as an amazing tool. Um, and so, yeah, I basically, as I'm saying, the future determines the present. And when you go for impossible goals and you get better and better at this, just like gratitude, you get better and better at thinking about an impossible goal, getting really honest about what you most want. I will say from my view, without an impossible goal, and I would, you know, anyone who's listening to this, but also you two thinking about it, you guys have done it many times where you went for something and you didn't know how to do it and it was big and you didn't, you know, but you had that, that faith, that commitment, that desire, yeah. and you figured it out. Yeah. And the goal did force you to let go of a lot of the things that then existed in your life. And so, you know, when you use the future as, as the goal and as the filter, it does require letting things go. And so one thing mm -hmm. I'll just add is, um, have any of you guys read Think Again, Adam Grant? Have you ever read? No. Okay, no. you gotta read that one. Just okay. because what he lays out in that book, which I think is beautiful, is Think Again is all about the psychology of um, unlearning, right? And so it's to that quote that I shared at the beginning by Mark Twain, where he said, it's not what you don't know that hurts you, it's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And so just as important as going for an impossible goal and learning how to actually do it and, and letting go of what, you know, just as much as learning how to achieve something that's impossible. It could be a person who wants to start a business. They don't know how to do that, right? Or it could be wanting to write a book, or what, whatever their goal is. They don't know how to do it. And so just as important as actually learning how to do that is letting go of the old identity, the old story, mm -hmm. even the old commitments that are making up your current life. Letting go or unlearning even of old models. Actually, this is one of the things that it says uh, in a lot of the research on going for impossible goals is because, you know, to the idea of the BHAG. The BHAG disrupts creates that identity crisis, because the goal is so big, it forces you to unlearn a lot of your current ideas about yourself, about success, about you know how to succeed and achieve. You know, If I'm going for an impossible goal, it's gonna force me to let go of a lot of what I thought writing a book was. And so that's the beauty of it, is it forces you to let go of outdated models, outdated frames and perspectives and ideas. And, it, 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 and honestly, the goal forces you to go and find new and better ones. And so it allows you to learn things you would have never otherwise learned. Mm -hmm. It's just a beautiful tool. One, one parting thing I'll just say is there's a really, really beautiful idea that I love in, in psychology called psychological flexibility. Flexibility. And I think when you really understand time as a tool, it creates that flexibility, even with what, with, with what you were saying, Amy, about, you know, he doesn't hit the 500. And so now he's rigid about how he feels about it, mm -hmm. right? It's like, no, it takes massive flexibility to immediately just create a past that is really powerful. Ooh, and so ooh, even, like that. you know, and so the ability to set new goals and then think from those goals and and be willing to look at your current situation. My son, Caleb, been saying, this this academy no longer works based on that goal. Um, to opt, you know, to, to, to strategize from the goal and look for new pathways, even a new identity, right? Um, is, is, takes a lot of flexibility, but also the flexibility of continuously creating the past in such a way that it's benefiting you in the present. Yes. Even if things appear to be falling apart, even if things didn't go well. Yesterday, you know, dealing with four teenagers, which I have, you know, often our life looks like a mess, right? <laughs> On a daily basis. And it's like, okay, how am I going to decide what yesterday means? It takes a lot of flexibility for me not to say, this is exactly what it means and this is what it always means and this person's wrong and I'm right. It's like, no. There's I like a different that way. Flexibility. Yeah. And so I think that this creates a, a huge amount of flexibility because yes, you need to adopt a new identity to achieve future goals. Um, but at the same time, you have to eventually let go of that identity to then pursue the ones beyond them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as an example, me writing these three books with Dan, like I went all in and I was excited about those books because they were completely different from the books I was writing before. And so they led me to different forms of knowledge, understanding, and learning that I wouldn't have had had I not gone for those. But while writing those, my future, you know, dramatically elevated such that that collaboration became below the new floor. And so I had to let go of that, including all of the benefits of being there. And that's not my identity anymore, you know, but I'm very grateful for my past. I'm grateful for what I learned, but the letting go of old ideas, old stories um, is a super skill mm. and it's, it's super important. Um, and I will just say to the idea of risk real quick, you share, verify share this. It's not that risky. Um, <laughs> like genuinely, like me letting go of that collaboration. A lot of people told me not to do it, but 
it was actually my future self that got me into that situation. It's my future self that got me out, my next level future self. And so there's, it's just not as risky as people think. Um, one of the things that humans do, and this is just one of the core, what they call cognitive biases is, is we inflate loss. We inflate the downsides, we inflate the risks, you know? And so as an example, that guy in the little business that I was talking about, him hiring those two people, there's risk there because honestly his business wasn't that big. And, you know, but how risky is it? He's hiring people above the floor. He's hiring people that are better than he's ever hired before. It might not work out, but like, what's the absolute worst case scenario? Maybe he just makes a little bit more money than he did before. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe he's a little backwards, but now he's got a, little, a lot of learning. The main point is, is that when you let things go that you think are like your resource, right? You're, by letting it go, you open that space to actually go and find and solve the stuff above the floor. Finding and, and figuring out the new solutions. And because you're operating from the future, you know, you're, you're gonna be fine. Like, you know, I'll be honest. In the last six months, I let go of my, what was my core business um, because I got really connected to that future self. Um, I got rid of my core marketing strategy, my YouTube team, right? And like, I let go of like, the system that I'm now creating to achieve the new goal is fundamentally different than the system that was my business before. My business was around coaching and a YouTube channel and X, Y, and Z, whereas like now it's like very different. It's a lot more simple. I had to let go of that. One of my favorite quotes, by the way, is the system is designed to defend the system. And so whenever you're operating from the future, you know, like the system doesn't want you to break it. Right. This, you know, like the team didn't want me to let them go. They wanted to stay. And so, but in letting go of my, my business, over 50% of my income, um, my income's now, and I didn't know how I would do it, but my income's already way going to be way bigger than it was before. But I would have never known that had I not like, let it go. Wow. So you do figure things out. And the letting things go is just as much a part of the commitment as the investing in the bigger future. And so it's very powerful when you, you know, one just last example, I'm sorry, I'm going off, but I shared this idea with someone who is ready to start a new business. He's had a business in the UK for like, you know, 15, 20 years. Um, sorry. And so anyways, he's wanting to create this new business and he has this one in the UK and his plan was just to keep it for 10 years. And I said, my man, your 10 year goal, let's achieve it in one. Again, time's a tool. And he said, well, if I'm gonna achieve it in one, then I gotta sell that business now. He said, I was thinking about keeping that business in the UK, but now if I'm gonna do this one in one year, it makes absolutely no sense to keep this. I gotta sell it and I'm gonna use that resource to do this, right? And so like, I think that you know when you're on to a good idea because it starts weeding out a lot of what you're currently doing. Yeah. Mm. Sorry if that was a bit long winded. So good, Ben. So, um, I just, a, a ton of gratitude, Amy, like we yes. could not have, well, I mean, was incredible. I was going to say, we could not have right. picked a better, yes. um, guest, but I didn't do any of the picking you did. So yeah. you could not have picked a better guest. Thank you for that. Ladies and gentlemen, listening to the Jasmine Star Show always means that you take an action. So the first action that you can start doing today is to let go. Let go of what isn't serving you. Let go of what your future self hasn't ordained as yours. And then go and ask yourself, what goal do I have and can I 10x it? What does that actually look like? And then the last piece of action, because we talked covered a lot, there's a lot of stuff you got to do <laughs> after this episode, is to actually go back and reframe yourself a year ago. Not the childhood stuff that I'm sorry you happened to go through, not the elementary bullying that I'm sorry you had to go through, not through the failed relationships or the miscommunication, but who you were a year ago. Could you imagine where you were today? I don't think so. Why, why are you not emotional? I'm talking to myself. I make this show for me. Thank you for the therapy. I'll send you a check. This is what the thing I needed to do. And when I am on a flight home, dang, my, my yesterday self is gonna thank my today self. What is wrong with me? What your your with yesterday me? self is blown uh, away by your today yes. self. They have no idea. They, like, girl, yeah, they're girl. like, yeah, they don't even know what the heck you're up to. Y'all, okay, the Jasmine Star Show to connect with Dr. Benjamin Hardy. You can find him at his website. You can pre order his book, Rapid Transformation. That is what I am going to be doing. I am like president of your fan club. Amy will probably like arm wrestle me for that. Watch and out, I'm girl. like, you're vice president. <laughs> I've already known whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> uh, Dr. Ben, Benjamin, can I be president? <laughs> yes, okay, Amy, okay. Amy's so obvious. She's, she's, she is the queen and she is, he's got so fine. I, fine, I'll be the vice president. Uh, you can definitely. Definitely connect with him on Instagram and on YouTube. He has so many free resources for you to redefine who you were so that you could step into who you are going to become. May we let go of the past and step into that future. Thank you for listening to the Jasmine Star Show. So there you have it. 
I hope you're leaving this conversation with a clear vision of how you can step into the person you want to be and take charge of your future. What was your biggest takeaway from today's episode? You know I love hearing from you, right? I'm just at Amy Porterfield on Instagram. Send me a DM. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you've ever read one of Dr. Hardy's books. I promise you, if you haven't, you're going to want to get your hands on any one of them. They are incredible. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Online Marketing Made Easy. I'll see you next week for more entrepreneurial goodness. Bye for now. 